Hello, everyone, and welcome back to class session meeting number three. We're going to kick this one off with a reading of the Aletheian side of the story. It is presented differently than the human side. Actually, can I give kind of a foreword Please. to that effect? Um, I decided early on when I started writing this that handling the Aletheian back history in the same format with which we had handled the, uh, the human side of things didn't make a lot of sense. The human backstory is captivating in its own way because we're already human. That's right. And everything that is presented, everything you see, from the, the futuristic technology all the way through the formation of singular governments to the expansion out into the stars, we know by rote. Anybody who's, who's even remotely into science fiction or has watched such you know, vaguely popular films as Star Wars is, is familiar with that. We've seen it. We're used to it. But trying to take the history of an alien species, of which we know very little and have to use a lot of imagination with, presenting it in that same kind of timeline-style format wasn't making a lot of sense. And I tried it. Uh, I had something about half as long as the human history already lined up and in a very similar format, and it just wasn't working. At no point did I have a solid understanding of who these people were, how they operated, what was their society like, how do they communicate with each other, uh, what is this about the power and how do they use it in their daily lives. There were so many questions and it seemed like the more I was trying to get the timeline out, the more questions I was creating. I wasn't answering anything. So I went back and I rewrote it all more as a narrative involving characterization, involving individual stories of people. And I decided that one of the more fascinating aspects of the story we decided upon so far, at least from the Aletheian side, was the formation of the mage lords of the Citadel. How did we get a little tiny group of very powerful magic users to be kind of in charge of everything. And I didn't want that to be just some uh, dark mystery that nobody ever knew, and I didn't want it to just be, oh, well, they wiggled their noses and snapped their fingers and suddenly they were in power. I wanted there to be some sort of a rich history to it. So I've changed everything around from my original intention and actually written what I feel is a pretty well put together story that explains that history and how we go from what came before to uh, the political and social climate that folks will enjoy when they start actually playing our game. So for those of you that are listening, <clears throat> try to keep up with characters. It becomes a little important. Uh, it's like a lot of fantasy stories. There are going to be some character names dropped over and over. I've tried to make those as clear as I possibly could, but uh, I think every single fantasy audiobook I've ever listened to takes me a few minutes to get into the swing of. So my apologies in advance if that becomes a little tricky. Anyway, okay. All right. Another world, hundreds of our years ago. An icy night wind blew outside the windows of the tall spire as Corridan, master of the Guild of Observers, was again ascending the stairs to the large room at the pinnacle. Once there, he stood in the center of his laboratorium. Lining the walls of the circular chamber were the ancient artifacts and instruments of an observer, lenses, scopes, and tables littered heavily with a seemingly endless array of devices. But the middle of the room had been cleared. Tonight, Corridan must once again try to use his power to see beyond what any of his instruments would allow. He must know if the strange barrier persisted, or if it had just been a passing curiosity. Alone, Corridan stood beneath the high-domed ceiling. Once again, he closed his eyes, spread his hands, and let his head fall slowly back. He could feel the power radiate outward from his brain, down his spine, to his fingertips, that familiar tingle. Light seemed to radiate from every pore of his skin. As it reached his toes, Corridan slowly raised from the floor. His robes lost contact with the stone, and the sensation of expansion consumed him. Focusing, channeling the power through his mind, Corridan began to reach outward, beyond his body, beyond the tower, beyond the citadel. He was no longer flesh, no longer physical. He was pure consciousness. He could see the land surrounding the great city in all directions, the mountains, the plains, even the coastlands more than a subcycle's journey away. Further he reached, his focus moving skyward toward the stars. He could feel himself approaching the cold void that existed beyond the skies and steeled his mind against the oncoming sensation. Then suddenly, just as before, he felt his being collide with it, a wall, a barrier, furious in strength but imperceptible until reached that washed over his existence, sending him reeling. 
Once more, Corridan returned to his physical body and collapsed to the floor. It had been this way for two sub-cycles now. He could no longer reach beyond the atmosphere of Aletheia itself. The stars, indeed even the neighboring moon Kamalia, were shielded from his power somehow. He no longer had a choice. There were steps that must be taken, and he was already concerned that he'd waited too long. That very night Corridan drafted his official request of an audience with the matriarchy. When he'd finished, he passed his hand over the scroll. It vanished in a bluish flash, sending his message by conduit directly to the court overseer himself. Surely the man would be asleep at this hour. Corridan would have to wait until morning. It was no small surprise, then, to receive a small scroll by conduit only moments later, requesting his presence at first dawn. As Ganelon, the first of the twin sons, crested the distant mountains, Corridan was ushered into the vast stone audience chamber. This was only the second time he had ever seen it, and the first time he had been on the audience floor. The walls of the large circular room were lined with delicate fluted columns of dark stone. Into the center of the floor were etched the symbols of the seven original great houses of Aletheia. Radiating from here, ornately carved stone staircases led to the upper gallery, where, on the far side of the room, were arranged seven heavily gilded thrones. Before him, in six of these thrones, sat the members of the matriarchy, each representing one of the six remaining great houses. In their right hands, each of the matriarchs bore their scepter of office, uniquely marked and decorated for their representative houses. At the far right sat the seventh throne, where once, the matriarch, where once sat the matriarch of House Nexiar. Corridan tried to make eye contact with Carlina, matriarch of House Garanosh. Before being accepted into the Hall of Matriarchy, she had once been a fellow apprentice observer, a rival, and a dear friend. Now, however, she seemed distant and would not meet his eye. On all five of the remaining faces was the same look of cold determination. Something was amiss. The encouragement he had been feeling at the favorable and expedient reception of his message now giving way to the sense that there were significant problems on the immediate horizon. A sudden hush plucked Corridan from his reverie, and it was only then that he realized that he was not alone on the floor of the audience chamber. Around him stood six warriors of legendary reputation, the battle lords of the Citadel. Their presence was at once intimidating and confusing. They were said to have been dispatched to various lands throughout the South Realms, dealing with insurgency and unrest from Nexian factions. What were they doing here? Why was he to stand among them? Corridan shuddered slightly. It was less than six great cycles since House Nexiar officially and violently severed ties with the Enclave of Houses. Some considerable tension had arisen over the abominable uses that the Nexians had found for the power. The tension quickly boiled over into open clashes in virtually every sector of the realms. Corridan himself had been trapped in one, small, one such skirmish. He had been on an official expedition, traveling through some village whose name he could no longer recall, when the attack had begun. The entire village had seemed to go mad at once, shrieking, striking at one another, using their powers to rip each other to pieces. He had watched in horror as a young girl dropped to all fours and began repeatedly slamming her face into the paving stones. She had looked up at him with the blood-soaked ruin that was all that remained of her features, and giggled at him playfully before running away. In a panic he had tried to flee, but had been nearly bowled over by a crazed villager who staggered out of his home, dragging his wife by the hair. In her arms was a small infant. Drawing heavily on the power, the man had immolated his family to little more than cindering bone. At once he lunged forward to scatter the bone and ash, screaming wildly, then paused, looking around as if lost. Only then had he seemed to understand his actions, and Corridan could still hear the anguished cries the horrific sounds as the man dug his own eyes from his head. It was only then that Corridan saw her. In the center of this nightmare, standing alone amidst the carnage, had been a single mage. She wore long robes of black, trimmed with brilliant glistening orange, the color of fresh blood. As she looked into Corridan's eyes, his head was racked with terrible pain. Suddenly he saw waves of felloc worms crawling across the ground toward him, their underbellies lined with rows of dripping fangs. The first of them latched around his ankles, seeming to bite all the way to the bone. He could feel their venom course immediately through his body, burning his lungs as he struggled to breathe. He, stra he staggered and fell, and the worms moved up his arms along his neck, some slithering into his mouth. Corridan had nearly succumbed to the agony, his vision going dark when, as quickly as they had appeared, the worms were gone. He was on his hands and knees, shaking violently, but unharmed. 
Even the pain was a fading memory, as if he'd awoken from a horrific dream. Before him stood a member of the militia, heavily wounded and bleeding, over the corpse of the Nexian mage. He pulled his sword from her back, took two steps, and collapsed, face down, dead from his wounds. The terrifying memory was chased away as the court overseer's staff was slammed down onto the stone with a sharp crack, beginning the audience. Sora of House Terelion, the current speaker for the matriarchy, stood and held her scepter aloft. At once arcs of raw power leapt from the immense crystals that floated along the edge of the inner rotunda, striking her scepter and filling the room with a tumultuous crackle. The matriarchy stands before you. Let those who serve the citadel remain vigilant. Those who wish to speak may now step forward declared Matriarch Sora, her voice echoing in the wake of the thunder. Vigilance! responded the battle lords, their fists against their foreheads. Immediately, Gorinor, the eldest of the battle lords, strode forward. He was the most highly renowned of the battle lords, loved by the people as a champion of living legend. Gorinor stood impressively in his black dress armor. Behind him flowed the dark blue cape of office, bearing the names of each of his battle lord predecessors. Emblazoned on his breast was a great thin serpent, marking him as a follower of House Athiar. Smaller, more intricate designs, inlaid with glittering rows of tiny arcanocyte crystals, adorned his pauldrons, breastplate, rondels, greaves, and gauntlets. These glowed a brilliant blue and pulsed ever so slightly, as if with Gornor's own heartbeat. Slung to his hip was Shatterer, a terrifying double-bladed axe of which many tales were written. A faint luminescence seemed to emanate from the edges of its blades and roll across the stones behind him. As the matriarch stared coldly, Gornor slowly knelt. Your eminences, I come bearing news of— We know exactly why you are here, interrupted Sora. What we do not know is why all five of your fellows have abandoned their stations to waste their time standing before us, if all we are to hear is the same plea for war. The gems embedded in Gornor's armor seemed to glow with brighter intensity. Apologies, your eminences, but our commands are all left in capable charge. Then be out with your business, battle lord, so that you may return to relieve your lieutenants. Your eminences, the citadel is under attack, Gornor said, speaking the words very steadily, staring deep into Matriarch Sora's eyes. Mirella of House Prithorius giggled. Is that so, battle lord? She turned over her shoulder. Court overseer, what news have we of such attacks? Clearly unprepared to be brought into the proceeding so harshly, and obviously not wanting to take sides this early in the audience, the overseer stammered. D none, y your eminence. Nor would you, interjected Firol, the youngest of the battle lords, hailing from House Judeonis. All long-range conduit activity is being interrupted. Our powers are being shrouded. Surely you— Gornor had arisen rounding on his young battle-lord for speaking out of turn. The crystalline patterns along his armor pulsed to near painful brilliance, and his icy stare stayed Firol's voice. "'Again with this story,' replied Sora, taking advantage of the pause. "'How many variations on the theme are we to hear? Are Nexians going to climb out from under the beds next? Are they already lurking in the closets, waiting to feast on the blood of our children?' "'You do not understand,' said Gorinor turning back to the matriarchs, his armor dimming slightly. There was sincerity in his voice, turning the statement into something approaching a plea. Such impertinence, murmured Sopea, matriarch of House Judeonis. We understand perfectly, replied Sora. This is the third time this cycle that you have stood before us begging to be unleashed upon the defectors of House Nexiar. Your enthusiasm is appreciated, battle lord. She almost spat the word. But your resolve in your duties is starting to prove questionable. Immediately the five remaining battle lords strode forward as one. Algoth, a great tree of an Alethian, flexed his arms, causing audible creaks from the thick armor of boiled leather. His fists burst into bright green flame, as did his eyes. Coridan felt no heat, but his skin tingled from the raw power that suddenly filled the room. At once several members of the royal guard strode forward. In unison they quickly made a complex series of gestures. And in a fraction of a moment, a cir the circular audience floor was surrounded by a shimmering dome, separating it from the elevated tier upon which the matriarchy sat. Slowly, the dome began to constrict threateningly. Coridan could feel the air pressure begin to rise, and felt no small amount of fear. "'Bring your pets to heel, battle lord,' said Sora coolly. With a glance from Gornor, Algoth stepped back, the flames disappearing as suddenly as they'd come. 
the other battle lords retreated a pace as well. The royal guard hesitated a moment longer, and then, at a nod from Matriarch Sora, performed a second series of gestures, again in perfect unison. The shielding dome above the audience floor faded away. Apologies, your eminences, Gornor grated, returning to his ceremonial kneeling position. My brother's overzealous response only comes from the passion with which they have defended these realms. We have continued to serve you faithfully. Each sub-cycle sees us lead more of your militia into combat to fight for this realm, and to keep you and our people safe. And yet you crave more bloodshed. You would have us declare open war on the Nexians? Sora asked. I would have you recognize the greatest threat the realm has seen in thousands of great cycles, your eminences, replied Gorinor. I would have you allow us to protect our people. You would have blood, shouted Sora, standing. Her hair began to stand on end, and the air around her hissed and crackled. Do you think we have forgotten the slaughter that took place immediately after House Nexiar left the Citadel? Do you think that these ongoing hostilities are somehow not your responsibility? That the blood of so many innocent families does not stain each of your hands? And now you would have us unleash you like a pack of rackthids upon those still remaining? Matriarch Sora, if I may, drawled Geron, gaining a warning glance from Gornor. Geron was slight among his companions, short and thin. He was known and feared as a brilliant but ruthless tactician, and stories spread far and wide of the cunning ways in which he would outwit his enemy's advances. His armor, made of thickly embroidered fair silk, made no sound as he moved. Flowing down his back was a, red, was a deep red cape, bearing the symbol of House Zanath, as well as the names of those who had once led in his place. Around his hands, and winding up the sleeves of his shirt, were thick fair silk straps, exposing only his fingers. Apart from this, he was the only one of the battle lords who appeared to be unarmed. Gorinor, surprisingly, seemed to know that this was coming, and stood, taking two steps backward, offering his place to Geron. Sora, clearly displeased by this gesture, looked down with open disdain at the man as he knelt, yet she returned to her seat. "'If you would, your eminence,' continued Geron smoothly, "'simply open a conduit to one of your remote magistrates,' Any one in Uralor or beyond will do nicely, I would think. Geron grinned sycophantically, a slight glint of anticipation in his eye. Her nose wrinkling in disgust. Sora turned to Matriarch Drisella, also of House Zenath. Drisella, you are the most adept at conduit creation. Would you mind humoring the honorable battle lord Geron? Her voice twisted these last words, turning them more into an insult than a display of respect. Impassively, Matriarch Drisella closed her eyes. The room seemed to ripple slightly with her efforts. Quite suddenly, she gasped and collapsed forward, holding her temples and wincing in pain. "'I cannot,' she breathed. "'You see,' simpered Geron, "'our powers are being shrouded. It is a common Nexian tactic, as anyone who had ever stood on a battlefield could tell you. Indeed, our lost brother Vistius, once battle-lord of House Nexiar, if you recall, was often known to use this as a means of first strike against his enemies. His grin widened, showing many of his teeth. "'And you can think of no other possibility?' asked Sora. "'None, your eminence,' said Geron, continuing to smile, locking Sora in his stare. "'It is as my noble brother says. We are being attacked.' Sora returned the stare coldly. "'That is enough, Geron,' said Gornor softly after a few moments. Bowing slightly, Geron stood and stepped back, his grinning gaze lingering on Sora for a long moment, causing an uncomfortable tension in the room. "'Surely,' said Gornor, returning to his position, "'you must see that this is at least a prelude to an attack. It is a classic maneuver, cut the enemy's means of communication, making intelligence near impossible. With no conduits, reinforcements cannot possibly come to help.' Not to mention there is no way of knowing what other powers are being— Fortunately, interrupted Sora, as if Gornor had not spoken, what seems to pass for intelligence among the battle lords is not necessary. We do, in fact, have a much more likely explanation, allowing wisdom to once again stay the hand of baser desires from lesser intellects. Gornor looked as if he had been physically struck by the words. Carlina, you were once an apprentice to Tazareth, master of the Guild of Observers, were you not? I was, whispered Carlina. Is there another explanation for the dampening of certain powers such as conduit creation? Sora asked. 
Yes, Carlina said, even more softly. Well, then, please enlighten our poor battle lords and give them the information that their thirst for blood has hidden from their minds. With a pained expression, Carlina proceeded. Every 538 great cycles, the orbit of Camalia causes it to move extremely close to Aletheia, causing a temporary dampening effect to a wide variety of arcane powers, especially those involving space distortion. She spoke almost as if reciting a passage from one of the ancient texts, getting the information out as quickly as she could before turning her face back down. "'Excellent. Thank you, Carlina,' said Sora, with the slightest of smiles playing at the corners of her mouth. "'And now, my noble Gornor, if you would please direct your attention to one of my guests this morning. Corridan, current master of the Guild of Observers, can you please tell us if we are approaching the event Carlina describes?' Corridan had almost forgotten why he was there, and his heart suddenly sank with despair. He had not been invited to report on his findings, or to be allowed to discuss the strange force that was blocking his observational powers. He was simply being used as a tool, a way to gain advantage. He was humiliated, and looked searchingly at Carlina, trying to gain eye contact. She would not look at him. Corridan? asked Sora pleasantly. Corridan thought quickly. Kamalia was indeed approaching the critical point of its orbit that would bring it nearest to Aletheia, but the significantly close distances would not take place for at least another two cycles, and even then none of his texts had ever mentioned the event causing anything more than minor disruptions in space and time-related powers, certainly nothing that should completely block a well-conjured conduit, nor anything that would prohibit observational powers. "'Well, speak up,' said Sora, an edge of impatience creeping into her voice. "'Yes, Your Eminence,' said Cordon very carefully. We are approaching that event. It— Thank you, Corridan, interrupted Sora. That will be all. As you can see, my most noble battle lords, not every sound you hear in the night is a monster coming to kill you. There are other solutions that exist in this world than outright warfare. Gornor was very pale. Behind him, Geron had begun to stare intently, his grin fading away into something far more malicious. But— your eminences, Gornor began. That is enough, Gornor, said Sora, cutting him off. You have served us with nobility, and we are for ever in your debt. However, we have heard your pleas in this for the final time. By first dawn tomorrow, I want all of you to be back at your stations, fulfilling your mandated duties. There is to be no more clamoring for blood to be spilt, even that of our Nexian brothers and sisters. Sora, I beg you, said Gornor, rising, his hands turned upward, stepping toward the seated matriarch. You must see that— Silence! shouted Sora. You have work to do, and there will be no more of this insanity. You will follow your mandate, or you will lay your signet at my feet. At dawn you will have returned to your charge to complete the tasks you have been assigned. If I see any of you before then, I will have you tried for treason. Are we understood? The crystals on Gornor's armor dimmed visibly. We understand, your eminence. By reason we do not, shouted Lorthax who to this point had not spoken. He took two great strides forward, his long purple robes billowing and the twin swords on his back clattering. Gornor stopped him with one massive hand on his chest. "'It is done, brother. We have done everything we can,' said Gornor softly, defeat ringing heavy in his voice. He turned and put his fist against his forehead, facing the matriarchs in salute. "'Vigilance!' "'Vigilance!' cried the other battle-lords in unison, all except Geron who only half-heartedly mimicked the motion, his voice not carrying further than his own lips. He continued to stare at Sora with an open expression that spoke of something more twisted than hatred, until his comrades began to turn and make for the door. As the battle lords filed out, Corridan remained. No one looked at him, not even Carlina. In moments he was alone in the chamber, and a guard was staring at him from the doorway, expectantly. End of chapter one. <laughs> I need to take a quick drink. All righty. Oh, Lord. Okay. Excuse me. That night, the winds had picked back up, though the night was clear. Along the corridors of the Citadel Palace patrolled the Royal Guard, each dressed in loose-fitting white uniforms with black armor at the chest, shins, and forearms. On each face was a black mask, containing a variety of protective enchantments, and allowing the wearer to see their surroundings as if lit by the midday suns. 
Nearly every point along the grounds contained some sort of focus crystal, placed and carefully enchanted to raise an alarm at the slightest drawing of the power. Anything more than the faintest trace would lock the grounds down, paralyzing all those who did not wear the proper enchantments. Through the grounds slipped a silent shadow. No rustle came from his fair silk suit as he gracefully danced between the columns, along rooftops, through windows. In such protected areas, conduit use, or even a perception shield, would be useless for subterfuge. This, however, was one of the primary reasons why Geron had volunteered for the task at hand. For many great cycles, Geron had studied an internal form of the power. Along with his command of air, he had become quite adept at masking his abilities, flexing his own interaction with reality, and giving his body a silent and lithe agility. He was darkness made flesh, and he reveled in the perfection and the art of his power. Tonight, Geron's purpose was death a purpose for which his skills made him uniquely capable. However, the plan had been clear, one death only, quiet and dignified. He must leave no trace of his presence, allow no witnesses to identify him. Yet there were strategic positions he must secure along the way. It was a delicate and sophisticated performance that Geron knew quite well, but had never attempted in something as thoroughly guarded as the Citadel Palace. He grinned behind his fair silk shroud as he began the night's work. At various points throughout the palace grounds, guards steadily disappeared. The first, Geron simply rendered unconscious by removing most of the air around the guard's head, the sudden pressure drop causing him to pass out. He never had time to hit the ground, but was deftly caught and dragged into a corner, where he was further subdued. Others he was able to surprise by more deft means, solidifying the air around his own body to hold himself against the ceiling, dropping down on two guards unawares. Using his fists and his feet, propelling the force of his blows by reinforcing them with tight bursts of air, he had incapacitated the two men easily. It had been so long since he had been able to use his physical skills in this manner, and he regretted that so few even bothered to train in its defense. So much dependence on the power, he thought. Does no one even bother learning the ways of martial combat these days? Things were going very cleanly, and Geron was quite, quite pleased with his assault so far. Surely there should be songs written about the night battle lord Geron single-handedly laid siege to the inner palace of the citadel, heroically routing out a cowardly traitor and saving the realms. He shook his head softly. No songs were ever sung of those who did this kind of work. In fact, duties such as this were measured in their success precisely by the fact that no stories were ever told, the heroic acts unsung. While he enjoyed the power of his, off of his silence, a quiet part of him mourned that he would never share in the glory worn by others of his brethren, especially Gorinor. As he slinked into a corner, a blinding pain surged through Geron, and he, as he was suddenly slashed from behind. Gasping at the sensation, he smelled the acrid smoke of burnt fair silk. He had just enough time to turn before a bright beam of fire shot forth at his head. A pile of black, ash-like dust fell to the ground where Geron had once stood. The guard, a slender female, her hands alight with golden flame, her blue hair rippling behind her black mask, strode over to the spot, where dark clouds were still billowing outward from the small pile. Will they never learn? thought Geron silently. The shift had been a risky move in such a protected place, but he had had no choice. His masking skills had been enough to protect him from raising an instant alarm. The small pockets of cinder coal he had carefully sewn into his suit gave a rather showy effect, he had to admit, and he had often used this as a means to startle oncoming attackers. It never ceased to amaze him that no one had yet figured it out. Everyone seemed to think it was some dark secret or ancient lost use of the power. Of course, there were many forms of teleportation and transfiguration, but turning oneself into a pile of dust? It couldn't be done, but was so sudden and visually startling that no one ever understood what they'd seen, nor, given his reputation and prestige, did anyone ever think to question it. He never shared the secret with anyone, not even his brethren. From his hidden vantage point, high behind one of the corridor's columns, Geron watched as the guard kicked the pile. She realized something was wrong and tensed, looking around quickly. A clever one, he thought. That decided it. Ever so carefully, he separated the air at either end of the corridor, creating a box walled with perfect vacuum. 
She would hear the slight popping sound, but it would keep sound from traveling very far. The stone he could not help, but that would make little difference. Shouts and screams would go unnoticed, he thought ruefully. As soon as her attention was properly turned away, Geron struck. She immediately rounded on him, seeming to expect the attack. Rather than continue the strike, Geron's hand smoothly diverted, grabbing the small crystal talisman the guard wore on her chest. It was an alarm beacon, which she could use to alert her fellow guards. In a swift move, he ripped it from her armor and shattered it against a wall. The move left him open, and he was rewarded with a stiff blow to his ribs, his lower abdomen, then his neck, then the left side of his face. He quickly lost count, but was able to retreat before losing consciousness. "'You are well trained,' Geron hissed, his body burning wherever her flaming fist had struck. She did not respond. Though the corridor was too small for a powerful fighter attack, Geron knew he must end this quickly. He still could not use enough of the power to win this fight with ease, a restriction that did not affect his opponent. He could feel her drawing upon the power, and instantly the ground beneath his feet began to burn. Rather than leap away, as she surely intended him to do, he drew on his own powers, and her ability stopped short as she saw him fall down through the floor, seeming to flail his arms as if in a panic. She never heard him rise behind her. So inexperienced, Geron thought. A pity. With tremendous force, his air-encased foot found the back of her left knee, which immediately shattered. She let out a cry of pain and alarm, which was stopped by the barriers at either end of the corridor. Even as she fell, Geron's fist came crashing down at the base of her spine, and he felt the bones separate slightly, crushed. She collapsed in a heap, not moving, not breathing. Irritated at his own rashness, Geron rolled her over, her eyes locked to his. She was alive, if only barely, though unable to move. He was no healer, but one did not spend so many years in combat without learning a thing or two. He closed his eyes and slid his hand beneath the shirt to the warm skin beneath. With as much of the power as he could draw without giving himself away, he repaired what he could. Much of the damage was beyond his abilities, but she would live. I am sorry, he whispered in her ear. Your bravery and your valor will be rewarded. I swear it. She stared wide-eyed in silent disbelief, as quietly he performed a short incantation that dropped her off into a deep sleep. After this he carefully stowed her in a small room just off the main corridor. With ominous purpose, Geron continued toward the matriarchy inner palace. Slowly, and with the grace of a wind serpent, Geron slithered onto a landing just outside the sleeping chamber of Matriarch Sora. Two guards were stationed there, but he had not yet been seen. Still, he was too tired and wounded to continue as he had with the previous guard. Carefully, conjuring an imperceptible amount of the power, he caused the air on the far side to pop ever so slightly, very nearly mimicking the sound of a pair of hushed footfalls. Fortunately, neither of these guards was as bright as their colleague had been. They both turned, one preparing to cast a brilliant bolt of intensely purple lightning. Jaren's face split into a dark grin as he quickly brought his hand crashing down at the base of the first guard's neck, using his falling body as a fulcrum to pull the other guard down onto his back. A quick and tight squeeze around the throat, and both guards were deeply unconscious. A few minor snags aside, everything was going according to plan. With a sound quieter than nightfall, Jaren slipped into the chamber. There on the bed was Sora, sleeping soundly. As he approached, he carefully whispered his sleep incantation, pushing the prone figure further into a much deeper sleep. Satisfied that his target would not easily awaken, Geron reached into a fold along the side of his shirt and drew a long, thin dagger. Along the length of its blade was a series of the finest scrollwork which glowed with the faintest purple light. He stood over the bed a moment, deciding how best to proceed. As cowardly as she had been, he had to admit, she was rather beautiful. It was a shame that it had to end this way. The knife was ancient, so old that few remained who even knew of its existence. It glimmered as if forged only yesterday, and Geron paused to admire its shine before advancing. The blade would part the hardest armor as easily as water, but against flesh alone it held a much useful power. Upon withdrawing the dagger from a slain foe, the enchantment would mend the sliced flesh, leaving no trace whatsoever of the cause of death. His grin spreading, Sharon carefully opened Sora's sleeping gown, lightly placing the blade against her bare abdomen, 
preparing to thrust it home to her primary heart in one swift motion. That won't be necessary, Geron, said a voice behind him. The statement had not yet finished as Geron spun, whirling the dagger toward the source in, of the voice in a deadly arc. His hand was caught tightly at the wrist in a massive hand, and at once he was face to face with Gorinor. You're getting better, said Geron, grinning. I didn't even hear you that time. You're hurt, said Gornor flatly. How bad were the complications? Nothing I could not handle, replied Geron, clearly on the defensive, but with a trace of amusement still lingering in his voice. Did you kill anyone? I don't think so, but there's at least one guard who probably won't walk again. Sad, really. She was rather pretty. Dancer's body. The plan has changed, Gornor replied, ignoring him and crossing to the far side of the bed. We're not killing Sora. How delightful, Geron replied. And how, by reason, do you plan to sway her to our cause? By any means necessary, said Gornor softly. He leaned over her figure, placing his hands on either side of her head. Geron's features immediately turned to disbelief, then to complete horror as the veins in Gornor's hands and arms began to glow a brilliant orange. No, Geron said. You cannot possibly mean to— it is forbidden, Gornor! I mean to protect the citadel and its people, said Gornor, a new coldness in his voice. How long, Jaron spat, how long have you been studying the forbidden powers? Jaron knew that the enchantments that protected the palace grounds would have no effect in here, and he quickly began to draw on as much of the power as he could to cast a great blast at Gornor. Perhaps he could send him flying out the window. He knew he could not best him in personal combat, but if he could achieve surprise... Fortunately, Gornor had not yet removed his hands from Sora's head. She began to writhe, as if having a nightmare. Her body arched, and she began to tear at her bedding. Since the day after the schism, brother, he answered. I knew that one day House Nexiar would force us into this position, and I alone will take responsibility for what must be done. You can't! Geron nearly cried. He had nearly drawn enough of the power to put Gornor through the chamber wall. If he somehow survived being pushed through the heavy stone block— the fall from this height would surely crush him. Though Geron's heart quailed at the thought of attacking such a noble brother as Gornor, an honorable warrior with whom he'd faced certain death countless times, he knew that such treachery could not be allowed. Better to kill Sora than to let her suffer through a destruction of her mind. I must, continued Gornor, it is the only way. Whatever the Nexians are doing, they mean to destroy us this time. We are all certain of it. The time has finally come to use a bit of their own power against them. Sora had begun to moan in a piteous way, her hands groping the air, trying to fend off an enemy only she could see. The sight was revolting, too much to be borne. He would kill them both if he had to. I cannot let you do this, hissed Geron, sheathing his dagger and dropping into a crouch. But even as his mind released its hold on the power, even as the powerful blast prepared to rip apart the chamber wall, Gornor was suddenly on the other side of the bed, towering over Geron. In less than an instant, Geron was lifted into the air, Gornor's massive hands on either side of his head, squeezing with crushing force. There had been no flash of teleportation, no quiet pop of a shift. How Gornor had closed the distance so quickly, Geron never had time to figure out. He gasped and struggled, but was unable to break free. With overwhelming horror, Geron watched helplessly as Gornor's powerful arms began once again to glow. Then he could feel the penetration of his mind, like tendrils reaching into his brain. The physical sensation of it repulsed him, and his body went slack. A crackling hum filled his ears, followed by Gornor's voice, which seemed to reverberate within his skull. We swore an oath to protect these people. You will do what is necessary to see that done. It is the Nexians who are the enemy, and these powers may give us the advantage we need to stop them, once and for all. The voice faded and was replaced by a roaring shriek that seemed to tear at the very fabric of his mind. He could feel parts of himself slipping away, memories, loved ones, experiences, falling through his fingers like dry sand. The tighter he tried to hold them, the more seemed to fall away. Feeling each one go was like watching the slaughter of one of his children. Just as he felt he could take it no longer, just as he became certain that death would surely overtake him, he was dropped brutally to the floor. This is the only way. Do you understand, Geron? Geron, uh, Geronor asked, 
his voice suddenly soft. Yes, Jaron breathed the mouth. Er, Jaron barely mouthed the word, tears leaking down his cheeks. Then stand, brother. There is more work to do this night. Obediently, Jaron stood. As he did, he realized something incredible. He was no longer afraid. Gornor was right. This was clearly the only way. How could he have ever doubted that the Nexian powers would be the only sure manner to combat the Nexian threat? He almost laughed aloud that he hadn't realized it sooner. He found himself admiring Gornor's foresight and bravery in this bold maneuver, and was simply happy that he was able to play some small part. He watched in fascination as Gornor turn, returned to the far side of the bed, carefully placing his hands on either side of Sora's head once again. This time, Jaron thought, her struggles even seemed beautiful, in their way. Sora's chamber would not be the last that the pair would visit that night. At second dawn of the next day, the matriarchy made a bold declaration of war against House Nexiar. Further, in this time of bleak and, and further in this bleak and trying time, they would unanimously step down from office, passing wartime rule to the battle lords, who would stand as the shield and sword of the people until such time as victory was achieved. Immediately, plans were set in motion to launch a full offensive into the Southland realms, routing out the Nexian strongholds remaining. War came quickly, and the people of Aletheia, from the citadel and her sister cities, all the way to the rural village dwellers, soon became swept up in the conflict. The ranks of the militia swelled overnight, it seemed. The first days of the war saw tremendous victories in the Southlands, and a great deal of bloodshed. It came as no small shock, then, when the Nexians launched a massive and devastating counter-offensive, this time from the west. With a single combined effort, the city of Talandoth, the largest city on the continent of Sherazoth, was completely obliterated. The backblast of that attack quickly began to spread across the continent, causing a wake of death and destruction. In front of this wave ran armies of Nexian battle mages, moving with swift efficiency, killing and using the dead to swell their numbers. Always they moved outward, away from the ruins of Talandoth and the destruction that poured forth from their terrible attack. For over a hundred of our years, the battle would continue. No corner of Aletheia served as a haven. Death and destruction reigned. Of the six remaining great houses, House Xanath would eventually fall. Nearly all of its members, including Battle Lord Geron, would either fall in battle or merge with other great houses. A similar fate befell houses Garanosh and Prathorius, with their rich histories living on in name only. This left only four great houses, including Athiar, Terelion, Judeonis, and of course the former House Nexiar. And so it was that the citadel soon found itself under siege by hordes of Nexian battle mages and risen ghouls. The massive army was led by none other than Orcellius, the former head of House Nexiar. Standing with him were Janiel, former matriarch, and Vistheus, formal, former battle lord. All three had disappeared so long ago during the Great Schism. No one had seen them since. No written record remains of exactly what happened during the great battle that ensued. What does remain is only legend and hearsay, and surely changes with each telling. The most widely accepted story is that the battle lords, along with all of their lieutenants, conjured as one, causing a massive beam of light to stretch down from the sky, all but annihilating the sieging army in an instant. What no one remembers, and what was carefully removed from further history, is this. Upon seeing this great display of power, Orcellius immediately stripped the life away from Janiel and Vistheus, leaving their bodies to collapse on the grass. As the battle was joined in earnest by the other Nexian battle mages, Orcellius turned and walked away, laughing maniacally. Orcellius was struck down by a single bolt of conjured lightning. His head was mounted over the gates of the citadel, and was later cast in bronze and steel as a commemorative trophy to the great victory of the battle lords, who began to call themselves the mage lords of the citadel. Within a matter of sub-cycles, the primary hostilities of the war would end, and all that remained was the terrible force that still spread across the continent of Sherazoth, which had steadily become completely wiped out through the course of the war. It was feared that, if left unchecked, the terrible force that the Nexians had spawned might stretch to other continents. By combining their efforts, the mage lords, along with their lieutenants, were able to staunch the ongoing power that was still emanating forth from the Nexian attack. The continent of Sherazoth, however, was considered a complete loss. It was to this land that the remaining Nexian survivors, and those who would later surrender, would be banished. Over time, 
the noble name of the land was lost, and it simply became known as the Nexian Outlands. The matriarchs would never return to power. Indeed, though they were each given prominent roles in the government, they were very adamant that at this time of rebuilding a stronger hand would be needed, lest the Nexians return. Over time, many Elethians completely forgot there ever was a matriarchy. Many of the more prominent recorded histories were destroyed in the war, and those remaining would gradually be altered, leaving only a heroic tale of the rise of the great houses and the formation of the mage lords of the citadel. Over, many, over the many mega-cycles that would pass, memories of the war would fade. The legacy of the mage lords would continue through their children and their descendants, though with lesser impact on the people without the fires of war to drive them together. Eventually, no one was left who even remembered that there had been seven great houses rather than four. Despite ongoing declarations for vigilance by the mage lords and those placed in governmental control by their council, the people eventually grew numb and complacent, their concerns moving away from this supposed terror. The Nexians were simply no longer seen as a threat, but more as a curious nomadic tribe of lower class. Stories of their use of the power would be used to frighten children. In a way, this would prove to be the Mage Lord's greatest failure. Without being able to provide more than stories which had gradually become legend, they were no longer able to inspire the people. Though the rule of the Mage Lords remains solid to this very day, the hatred of the Nexians has waned to little more than a passing curiosity. The Nexians, however, have never forgotten. Very good. Thank you. <clears throat> Ooh, water. Yeah, I need some. Uh, well, thank you guys for listening through that. It's a, um, yeah, it's, a, <sighs> it's an involved yeah, that, uh, story. <laughs> yeah. Actually, it was kind of fun how that came about because, I mean, I wrote it with all of the, uh, the backstabbery and all of the plot that was supposed to be there, and then I, I kind of read it off to Jason. And in short, what we ended up butting heads about was there just wasn't enough magic. So it kind of became that he had sort of seen the pre-screener before all the special effects were in. So I had to go in and in post add in all of the, the cool uh, visual effects for it. <laughs> now there's um, tomorrow. I, I don't know what Zach's... I know Zach's got things he's doing tonight and, and uh, tomorrow, but... One of the things, if there's, uh, if we have time to make a few tweaks on, let's talk about textbooks. Yeah. Because this, the interesting thing, which you guys just heard. I only used it twice, Larich. Actually, maybe three times. What's that? The Color Purple. It was a good movie, though. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> there, there, are little, there are little things like that that I imagine I'm going to like discover as I read back through it about 17 more times, and I'll change colors here and there, and little things like that so the stuff doesn't get repetitious. As a matter of fact... Uh, there was an issue that I changed right before I started reading uh, in the first part of the of the meeting where I had accidentally repeated one of the great houses and screwed things up. So there's all kinds of little tiny stuff like that that will probably get, you know, tweaked and nudged. I just thought I'd mention. Sorry. What we do have now is a very rich backstory in which many other stories later down the road can be explored if we want to. Absolutely. Without a doubt, especially the hundred years during the uh, the mage during the mage wars, yeah. During the mage wars. Which I intentionally left pretty vague. So if you guys are wondering about that, that's just one of those things that I folded up so I could open it up later if I wanted to. Yeah. I, I love being able to, to see where the mage lords come from. That's fantastic. Um now moving forward, because this does not bring us up to current day. Not really and um and Rina uh, Kula is very curious about the great barrier <laughs> very nice yeah nicely caught nicely um nicely caught <laughs> well what you guys have just heard is kind of like book two. don't worry about that it's kind of could be my uh, my father oh is he coming over i don't know he does that sometimes oh um that's okay uh i can always just get back to him later uh, in any event uh what you guys have just heard is kind of like the second part to the story, and the third part is going to actually take place kind of in our current line of history when the game begins. The way that I'm planning on doing it is to... Pres actually, actually, with the textbooks, the, the one that uh, we may be reading off tomorrow is, is still not quite where the game actually begins, mm -mm. but it's, it's more closer to our time. Yeah. But there, there is a series of textbooks 
I'll let you go ahead. Well, there, I went back and forth. They went from uh, high school textbooks to kind of field guides that would be given to Elethian settlers for the first time, those uh, actually venturing to the planet. Uh, and, well, there's also uh, some journal entries, but those are those will probably come a little bit later. And the, the idea is to, now that we've got something very rich and very detailed that gives some characterization and a little bit of colorful background for uh, how the Alethians kind of got to where they are, now I can deliver some fact. And now I can start grounding things with a little bit more um, hard information, I guess you could say. Talking about the planet itself, its geography, its socio-political structure, and things that someone might want to know if venturing to Alethea for the first time. That's right. And those little texts are coming along quite well, especially where we, um, as humans, interact with them for the very first time. Yeah. That's actually a very exciting part as well. So it's, it's a lot of... I've tried to map out first contact re reasonably well. Enough where I know what happened. It's just the little details that need to be kind of hammered on. Yeah, but it's it's awesome. Yeah. And uh, just depending on how things go, if nothing else, maybe even just first draft can be read out tomorrow to the other class. Just because it's, it's uh, I, interesting. I don't want to promise right now. Because mm -hmm. if, it, if it's at a spot where I think reading it would give away too much in, a poor, in too poor of a state... Then I'll okay, I'll try to read something. I'll try to get something to where I can present. <laughs> I just I'm kind of picky about uh, how it gets presented. Now let's do this. Let's go ahead and bring this to a quick close. Anyone that needs to take a break now is a perfect opportunity to. And we'll start back up in a few minutes. Then we can start with uh, any questions that anyone may have because I see some already starting to uh, come across uh, Skype or Skype huh, IRC. Yeah, yeah. And uh and then we will go from there into some of the other things we wanted to talk about. So, let's go ahead and take a break and that's going to wrap up this video. Thanks guys. <laughs>